Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Textry. Today we are diving into the spooky bookie territory because we're going to jump back in time to early 20th century spiritualism. So spiritualism back then was a little bit different to what it is now. Now I, I hear a lot of people saying that they are spiritual. Back then, it was a movement that was fascinated by the idea of the spiritual world coexisting with the reality and the idea that the spirits of the dead exist and they can communicate with the living. So as the movement was gaining more and more popularity, people would, you know, host seances and try their best at becoming worldwide famous mediums. And what's interesting is that the mediums were often female, not only traditionally, but also possibly because it allowed them to actually have an independent career. And they would either host public demonstrations of their psychic powers, or they would host private shows, or if they got really big, they could turn into those medium celebrities that would travel the world and be subjected to various tests to determine whether or not their powers were real. Now, what I think is important is that a lot of the beliefs that were part of spiritualism at the time came from lack of knowledge, basically. For example, a lot of photographs that supposedly showed spirits or, or plasma activity are really simple to achieve if you know how photography works. But a regular person didn't know about photo manipulation or double exposure, so to them, a photo seemed to be unquestionable proof of otherworldly beings. So most people were not aware of simple magic tricks as well, so they did not believe there was a logical explanation for what they saw. So today we are talking about a Polish woman, Stanisława Tomczyk. Stanisława was born in 1885. There isn't much known about her early life. However, apparently in 1905, during protests against the Russian rulers, she was arrested and jailed for 10 days. Now, the scientists and uh, spiritualists at the time claimed that this was the event that resulted in her gaining her powers, but she also struggled with some mental con conditions as a result of her experience. I mean, there is a split personality aspect of of this lady that, like everything regarding her, I'm not sure if it's actually 100% real or if it's 100% fraud. So she rose to fame partially because of, of a Polish spiritualist, Julian Ochorowicz, who was conducting numerous experiments using her powers and was writing scientific reports on those experiments for the Annals of Psychical Science. Ochorowicz uh, stayed with her in a house in Wisła, which is a Polish town, and he was basically studying her. The main thing that Stanisława Tomczyk was allegedly skilled in <laughs> was she was said to be able to levitate various items, do things like move the dial on the clock without touching it, and bringing a snowball inside the room without ever leaving the room. So basically, those sorts of things that were in conflict with what we know about physics, basically. <laughs> so obviously everyone was a little suspicious. People were like, okay, so like, how did the snowball get inside the room? How is the clock moving if she's not touching it? There must be some sort of a device that is controlling it. But Ohorovic was such a staunch believer in her powers that he basically convinced everyone else. He was like, no, guys, I'm telling you, this is a real deal. I've checked her clothes. She was not allowed to leave the room. There is no way she could have pulled this off if this was just pure magic tricks. According to him, one of the big elements of Miss Tomczyk being able to use her powers was the fact that she had a split personality and her alter was a small girl that she would call little Stasia. So basically, Stasia is like her name in diminutive form. There, there was some writing about some other Stasias being around, so at some point, I guess, maybe it developed into some other alters as well. Now, keep all that in mind, as we delve into what exactly Ohorovich wrote to prove that Miss Tomczyk is in fact the real deal. So his first writings were in 1909. The article's name was A New Mediumistic Phenomenon, where he sort of introduced his subject and talked about the sort of things that she was able to do. The medium for physical effects, of whom we shall soon have to speak, is a young Polish girl from Warsaw. 
pretty simple, modest, intelligent, without any education, and extraordinarily gifted mediumistically. She has been living for two months in my country house at Viswa, where I am attending to her health, which is somewhat weak, and to the development of her faculties. Under these conditions, while avoiding all spiritistic or anti-spiritistic suggestions, I hope to be able to make of her a medium really useful to science. My task is made easier by three circumstances. Mademoiselle Tomczyk is naturally truthful and able to control the tendency to unconscious fraud, characteristic of the majority of mediums. She is not a spiritist and had no preconceived or suggested opinion as to the nature of the effects she produces. Finally, although being easily hypnotized, she is not suggestionable in the proper sense of the term. The senses are never held in the dark, the control is always sufficient and the medium is always inspected immediately before the production of the phenomenon, which has been announced. Unannounced phenomena do not count. Spontaneous trance, which greatly tired the medium and sitters, has for some time been completely abandoned. All the experiments take place in the hypnotic condition induced by myself. There are never more than two persons present at the seance which I will explain in chronological order, dwelling equally on successes and failure. So basically he's saying, I did everything in my powers to make sure that she's not a fraud. I hold seances during the day, I check if she's not hiding any devices, I put her in hypnosis, and I will be honest about whether or not the uh, experiments were successful. Okay, so one thing, for, for whatever reason, her name was Stanisława, which is a Polish female name. In this article, he keeps referring to her as Mademoiselle Stanislas, which I'm a little confused about, but... I will just read it as Stanisława every time because that was her actual name. The phenomena produced by Mademoiselle Stanisława are reported to be the work of a fluidic personification called Little Stasia, who resembles her, though much smaller, about 22 inches high. At the first sounds I asked the question, who is this Stasia? And the medium replied in trance, it is my double. Who would not want a tiny sidekick that can pull off magic tricks? It kind of reminds me of those animals in Barbie movies. So just the background of what he is trying to achieve here. He had this clock. He explained the whole mechanism, but it's difficult to grasp since there were no, no photos of it. But basically had, he had a clock that was not a working clock. It was specifically made for the experiment. And the goal of the experiment was to move the dial so it shows the hour that is requested of the medium. January 1st, 1909, the sleeping medium was in a state of childish somnambulism, a frequent characteristic of the ecstasy of olden times. She knelt on the couch before the magical clock. Her eyes were completely closed, but this did not prevent her from seeing it, for she could see through her eyelids. I purpose publishing a special article on this subject. Okay, not you plugging your own article <laughs> in, the, in the middle of this one. It was four o'clock in the afternoon. We were near the window and there was still sufficient daylight. The apparatus was set at 12. I asked for the figure three. She took the pointer, held it a second in the palm of her left hand, then replaced it without the slightest contact with the adjusting mechanism. The arrow set in motion by her stopped at 11. The experiment was a failure, but at the same time, the hour indicated was not that for which it had been set. She tried again. The hand marked 12, then 1. I had an impression as if they were fumbling and trying to find the way to reach 3. So he's saying she didn't actually show the right hour, but she did manage to move the dial to a different position. The medium dissatisfied asked for another figure. I chose 10. After the same manipulation, absolutely unsuspicious, the needle stopped at 10. The medium was well satisfied. She clapped her hands triumphantly and asked me to give her another figure. I asked for five. In this experiment, something happened, which was too strange to be result of chance. The pointer began to mock at us. 
It indicated all sorts of hours except the one I had asked for. Not only did it plainly avoid the 5, but after several attempts, it seemed as though it was going to stop at 5, but suddenly stopped elsewhere. The dial just went crazy. At this moment, the medium, discouraged by this long series of failures, joined her hands in prayer and looking at the turning pointer said, I implore you, stop at 5. And the hand stopped at 5. Do you think it was little Sasha who influenced the clock? I asked. I do not think so, because I have not seen her. Have you had any sensation, whatever? Nothing, a little numbness in my fingers, perhaps. And really her fatigue seemed to me to be different from that experienced when little Sasha came on the scene. Her hands were rather cold, she seemed to be somewhat exhausted, her pulse was accelerated, but that was all. He is always closely monitoring her symptoms. He's like, are the hands cold? What is the pulse? Is she fainting? Is she weak? Which is interesting because assuming she was a fraud, she must have had some pretty clever ways of faking it or making him believe that she felt different than she actually did. So after that, he conducted a lot more clock experiments and then he wrote this. The face of the medium was burning, but her hands were cold, particularly the left. I did not allow her to amuse herself anymore with the clock and we resumed our seats. At this moment, a knife fell at our feet. It was lying on my desk, open, but fell closed. The distance was five feet. The medium's hands were both visible and motionless. We had passed by the side of the desk, but I am certain the medium took nothing from it. Certainly little Sasha wished us to take notice of her, but I forbade her to produce any phenomena, she paid attention to me sometimes, in order not to exhaust the medium. The latter, who now saw her and heard her voice, said that she only asked permission to show her dynamometric power and assured us this would not fatigue the medium. I consented but told the medium, still in trance condition, first to try her strength without the help of little Stasha. So little Stasha is difficult to define because at some points it's like little Stasha is taking over Stanisława, but then sometimes, like here, little Stasha produces energy on her own and she sort of is a ghost-like entity. To figure out the clock situation, he was also testing the medium strength with a dynamometer and he did notice that when he was testing little Stasha, the results were like three times as big. And he did also notice that the left hand is stronger than the right hand. So he came to the conclusion that the left hand, which was the one that was setting the clock in motion, the active hand, that was the hand where the mediumistic force concentrated. I was making this reflection when little Stasha, to prove that she was capable of exciting the same concentration of power in the right hand, insisted that I should allow her to repeat the experiment. The medium stretched out her hand towards an incandescent lamp, which lighted my office, took the dynamometer and grasped it without much effort. When I saw this small hand close and tremble convulsively, as though grasped and shaken by another hand or perhaps by two other hands, and the medium called out, Oh, the wretch! She has hurt me! She has dug her nails into my flesh! The dynamometer marked 200, which corresponded to a pressure of 70 kilos, and I found the palm of the medium bruised by excessive pressure on the side next to the thumb, and on the skin of the wrist there were deep marks of small fingernails. The imprint disappeared after the medium awoke, but a marked redness remained for several hours. I have often made the same experiment with Eusapia Paladino, but have never obtained so great a difference from the normal. But I am no longer astonished at anything. I observe facts. Uh, Eusapia Paladino was an Italian medium that was probably one of the biggest names in that era that he also conducted experiments with. So that's what he is referring to here. So this is a little spooky. Little Stasha hurt the medium by uh, pinching her flesh with her nails. But also the way he describes things that are absolutely scientifically impossible. And then he goes on to say, I observe facts. 
is such a clever way to make you believe what he's writing. Because if he was like, this is making me question everything, I no longer know what to think of religion, then you would probably be like, okay, this guy is clearly lost. But if he is going like, I am a scientist, everything I do has a scientific background, I conduct controlled experiments in controlled environment, cold facts, that's way more convincing. January 11th, 1909. After the series of experiments of which I have written, Mademoiselle Stanisława went to Kraków with a lady companion for distraction and to do some shopping. She remained there 10 days. I took advantage of the absence of the medium to write the chapters which have already appeared and to reflect on the experiments which would complete the preceding observations. As often happens in this class of research, in proportion, as the moment of a direct perception recedes further and further into the past, I began to doubt it all. So he's also like, don't get me wrong, guys. I'm always questioning what's happening. I'm always unconvinced fully until I have complete proof. Not completely, because I could not find any explanation other than that of a mediumistic phenomenon, but the phenomenon itself was so very improbable that I said to myself, it is not possible. It must be an illusion, some coincidence of some kind, and it is probable that in repeating the experiments, I shall find nothing. I had a presentiment based on the fluctuations peculiar to the more subtle mediumistic phenomena that the experiments I proposed to carry out would lead to no serious result. I became all the more impatient to commence and after having granted the medium a day's holiday to recover from the fatigue of her journey, I arranged a seance for the afternoon. Mademoiselle Stanisława returned well in health and pleased with her excursion, and the conditions seemed to be excellent. I wanted to take the usual measures to ascertain her condition, but just before she came up to the first floor, while she was still in her own room on the ground floor, a log of firewood was thrown on the stairs. A useless and fatiguing phenomenon, after which she only gave momentarily to the dynamometer 20 and 20. Her head ached slightly at the temples and her sensitiveness was much blunted on the left side of her body. Little Stasia, as if she wished to make up for lost time, produced phenomena to right and left, but chaotically and unexpectedly, as if she were more ungovernable than usual. Several objects were brought from a room on the ground floor, a handful of snow fell on the table, a metal seal was put into my pocket, a piece of charcoal was thrown at us from the stove over three yards away, the large clock hanging on the wall was opened and stopped, the cord of an electric bell was shaken about and pressed and the bell set ringing, etc. So it sounds like little Stasha was just getting bored <laughs> and she was like, let me present to you all of the stuff I learned while I was away. <laughs> but also, if Stanisław Tomczyk was a fraud, she may have been afraid that during the time she was gone, he began to have some doubts, so she had to prepare a set of tricks to keep him a believer. January 12th, 1909. Hypnotized for her health at four o'clock, she amused herself at first with various trifles. She walked about my room, then she said, come and play with the clock, will you? With pleasure. She placed herself as usual on her knees on the sofa. I took my pencil and a sheet of paper for the purpose of taking notes, and we commenced. Is little Stasia there? Why, you have not seen her. It is precisely because she is here that I proposed the clock. She has come because of your request yesterday. Little Stasia was standing close to the sofa between us. She was quite naked, about one foot seven inches tall, her long hair hanging down. It is the same color as the mediums whom she strongly resembles, though much prettier. Unfortunately, I could not see her, but we shall see she proved her presence. The medium was her speaking trumpet and she offered turned around. Better to hear what she said. It's cracking me up because he's like describing this very realistic appearance. And then he's like, well, I didn't see it, but, but it was totally there. Then he conducted more clock experiments. He was really onto the clock because he thought that by writing down the particular hours that are appearing, he can like crack it. He can find out the source of what is going on. Then he was like, okay, let's try something different. Then we passed on to an experiment destined to complete that of yesterday. 
This was the stopping of a large real clock without opening the glass doors. This clock is wound up every 15 days and had not stopped once during the last 10 years. The medium in the somnambulistic state placed her left hand on the wall and her right hand in front of the glass. At the end of a minute, the pendulum momentarily slackened its speed but did not stop. There is too much light, said the medium. Allow me to perform the experiment for the first time with less light and then we can repeat it in normal light. She removed the incandescent lamp to another room, leaving the door wide open. The light was still sufficient for us to see all over the room and to follow the oscillations of the pendulum. Two minutes afterwards, under the same conditions, the pendulum slackened and then stopped. The medium was very fatigued. Her legs trembled, but her exhaustion passed quickly away. She manifested much joy at having succeeded. At a given moment, under the impression that the side glass to the right still admitted too much light, I wanted to cover it with my right hand, so that the disc of the pendulum might be more shaded. Don't do that, said the medium. Little Stasha is holding her right hand there. You have interrupted her action. The light is all right. Then is it always little Stasha who does everything? Yes, she held her fluidic hands on both sides of the box and she acted through the glass doors, making the stopping movements, which slackened, as you saw, the oscillations of the pendulum. Do not her hands pass inside? No, they cannot do that. Why? Can she not pass through a closed door? Through the cracks of a closed door only, not otherwise. She cannot pass through wood, a wall or glass. And how does she pass through a crack? She lengthens and becomes very thin. Do not forget that she is only a vapor, a kind of air. And how does she transport an object with her? She also makes it larger and more vaporous. This is why sometimes when I see little Stasha carrying something, I tell you it is something very long and whitish and you accuse me of inaccuracy on seeing a key fall. And yet I do not lie. You know I never do that. I tell you what I see, it was long and white, that key, when she held it in her hands. But at that moment it was invisible to you, just as little Sasha is. And then when she let the object fall, it contracted and condensed and took the color peculiar to it. She has a whole theory here, which I think is interesting because, again, if we are assuming that she was a fraud, what a clever way to make someone believe you just trying to come up with a whole philosophy of how things work. If you were like, I don't know, I don't know who little Stasha is. She's just a ghost. She's like a ghost. She's floating. She's pretty. She's a girl. But if you have a whole thing that cannot be scientifically explained, that is invisible, that the researcher that is trying to roast you cannot study. I think it adds longevity to your fraud, basically, because it would take him so much longer to study it. In a word, according to the medium instructed by little Stasha, the stopping of the pendulum through glass, like the regulating of the magic arrow, was due not to the direct action of the etheric hands, but to an unknown force which oozes from her hands which acts at the distance and which can be concentrated on a point chosen at will. The etheric hands themselves were not able to enter and they were not sufficiently condensed to act materially on a heavy object. Yet the occasion lent itself to discussion because just before the seance, the electric bell of the house was set ringing without visible cause. Questioned on this point, the medium said that little Sasha had done this. Knowing that a seance was going to be held, she wished, in this manner, to express her opinion that it was time to commence. She could therefore press the button of a bell. The medium sat down on another armchair by the side of the lamp. The light opens my eyes and hurts me, she said. You know well that that hurts you, and yet you sit down by the side of the lamp. I had scarcely said these words when I saw the lamp go out, and yet it was well filled. I lit it again, shrugging my shoulders. The medium's eyes closed again, and she read the title of a magazine on my desk. When her eyes are opened, she can see nothing, and when they are closed, she sees well. It is enough to drive one mad, and yet we must continue. Before I made the acquaintance of Mademoiselle Stanislava, I said to myself, Ah, if only I had a good medium at my disposal, with whom I could make the experiments, have facts, plenty of facts. I have had more than enough theories. 
Today, I have more facts than I ask for, and the theories have vanished. It is hard work searching for new truths. Let us keep on all the same. Her main thing, though, which we haven't touched on yet, was being able to levitate objects. There is several photographs of her doing that, where she has her hands stretched out, and there is an object in between the hands, and it, it seems to be levitating. Now, the first thing that comes to our mind is obviously there's probably an invisible thread in between of her hands that she used. Funny you should think that, because... <laughs> Julian Ohorovich actually saw a thread multiple times and he was like, this is an energy thread. <laughs> so let me, let me read to you what he thought of the thread. After dinner, there was an unexpected phenomenon. The apport of a wooden ashtray, which was in my bedroom on the first floor and which came just at the moment when I wanted to light a cigarette, threw the medium into an auto-hypnosis, very fatiguing at first, then calmed by her active childish somnambulism. I took advantage of this to make some experiments, wishing to ascertain if the force radiating from the tips of the fingers of the double was able to operate not only through glass, as in the first experiment with the real clock, but also through glass and empty space. I brought a Crookes radiometer, a ball of glass hermetically sealed in which there is a perfect vacuum containing a very light wheel which turns under the influence of a bright light. The medium held her two hands on the two sides of the apparatus without touching it at a distance of about six inches. The light, which was sufficient to see well, was far from being sufficient to set the wheel in motion. At the end of a few minutes, the medium felt a tingling in her fingers, which she called the current. The wheel moved and turned a little, but this movement was not caused by a direct dynamic action. It turned because all the apparatus was being shaken by mechanical agitation, absolutely as though the medium has held a thread in her hands, the pressure of which raised the radiometer laterally. Whatever this thread was, I did not see it and it was not found between the medium's hands. I again tried, but the result was the same. That is to say, I did not obtain a decided mechanical action through the vacuum. I then tried to at least elucidate the causes of movement in the air. Several small objects were moved and raised under the same conditions, proving that the nature of bodies counts for nothing. Various metals, wood, glass, leather, paper, were displaced and raised with equal facility. I observed, on the contrary, a great influence exercised by the form of the object. After each experiment, the medium's hands were cold and the palms were quite covered with perspiration. Another experiment, a small calendar in book form, was first displaced and opened as by a thread, the two ends of which were held by the medium. Then this thread found a good position in the middle of the pages and raised the book by the back. The calendar rose, sustained by the hands of the medium from a distance. It rose to a height a little above my head, and then by the light of the lamp, I saw, yes, I saw quite distinctly, a black thread. Dude, <laughs> he is the king of the Lulu. Not very thin, going from one of the medium's hands to the other, the right end of which was not stretched, but hung underneath the medium's right hand in the form of an irregular spiral. Wait, I said to the medium, do not move any further. But just at this moment, she began to lower her hands, wishing to bring the object onto the table, and the calendar fell flat down, exactly as the arrow did the other day. There was nothing between the medium's fingers. From the moment when I mentioned having seen a thread, the medium behaved as if she wished to contradict these suspicions in various ways. <laughs> I wonder why. The thread being no longer visible, the medium held her hands motionless for the greater part of the time, and in spite of this, objects were raised and removed, sometimes to the right and sometimes to the left, sometimes even turning, and when she raised her hands parallel with the object, she moved the fingers about or executed little descending and ascending movements, independent of the object. Her hands, always very cold and very wet, were moreover empty and did not leave the table a single instant. It is possible to create mediumistically between the medium's hands a sort of thread, possessing for some minutes a certain consistency, which diminishes and disappears with the putting apart of the hands. 
The formation of the mediumistic thread is accompanied by a sensation of chill. This thread, created by the unconscious imagination of the medium, seems to present a case of objective material idioplasm. My dude, you're using a lot of words for the fact that your study subject has been caught cheating. <laughs> the strong desire to raise a small object at a distance brings by association the idea of a thread which would do this. So he saw a proof that this was all a fraud and he still found an explanation. He was like, this idea is realized in a moment of mono-ideas. In common life, the sight of a thread, that is to say certain vibrations of the ether, produce the idea of a thread. Here, by force of the law of reversibility, the inverse is produced. The idea of a thread provokes the sight, the objective phantom of a thread, that is to say, certain vibrations of the ether. We are at the boundary which separates illusion from reality which combines them, I would say, because this phantom is not a simple hallucination. It exists objectively. It produces palpable effects. Is it a thing created from nothing? Is it the etheric body of a real thread? Is it the idea materialized? And if so, by the aid of what substance, particles of ether, atoms of the medium's body, of her gown, of the object, mystery. Provisional explanations of the medium. So he was like, okay, I just saw a thread. Do you have a thread on you? And she was like, okay, listen, you know nothing about me. Let me explain this to you. And she said, it is the current which is accumulated in me by the force of concentrated attention and desire. I know when it is coming by a shiver all over my body, by the heat of my cheeks, by the cold breath, by the numbness and tingling in my fingers. This current does not go from one hand to the other, it goes from my hands towards the object and there stops. It does not go through the object. If you thought that the little calendar was hung up and suspended by a thread, it was only an appearance. <laughs> okay, go off, queen. I mean, you're gonna lose your job, so work. This current is not a vibration. It is something which really oozes out from my hands, from the ends of the fingers only. When we turn the gas tap, the gas escapes with a whistling sound. Here, nothing whistles, but something analogous is discharged. Not from one opening, but as from a number of small holes. This current gets thin and breaks as I draw my arms apart. Its prolonged outflow fatigues me very much. When the fingers are drawn together, it forms like a skin of threads, which reach the object. When I open the thumb separately, the skein doubles itself and is able to support a much larger object. A foreign contact immediately cuts this current and causes me pain, so I instinctively seek to avoid it. That is all that I am able to say for the moment. I am not educated, I do not know how to express myself properly. Pardon me if what I have said does not sound like common sense. We will ask little Stasha, perhaps she will know more. <laughs> so she comes up with a whole explanation of what it feels like, of why the thread appears, and then she's like, but what do I know? I'm not, I'm not a scientist, I'm just a simple girl. Iconic. Then he bought a small roulette and he was trying to see if she can make the roulette show the number that he wants it to show. The whole description is a little weird because it does sound like she was successful at times, but then he and his friend tried the same thing and she wasn't much better. <laughs> so he really wanted it to work, I think. I sent to Krakow for a small roulette, which was guaranteed to be of Swiss origin and of perfect construction. In order to familiarize the medium with it, I proposed first to have a game with it in the usual manner. I play on 33, said Mademoiselle Stanislava, and the number 33 came up. Her luck was not always the same, but as a matter of fact, she won almost always, not only that day, but the two following days. This is probably, to me, the biggest cap of this whole story, because are you telling me that she could make the roulette show the number that she wanted it to, and she did not capitalize on it? She did not go around the world and get rich. Are you kidding me? She rather stayed in, in Wisła with Julian Horowicz and was bringing snowballs inside. Come on, that's Cap. Little Stasia, always attentive, fixed the numbers. So his theory was that it's not actually Stanisława doing it, it, it's Little Stasia like changing the numbers. Do you really believe you can influence the roulette? I do not know, I try, replied the little invisible genius. Eight days afterwards, we made up a game for our amusement. 
Mademoiselle Stein's Wava won all the time, and in order to give an idea of her luck, I noticed that in playing with centimes, she won 18 crowns. She did not know if the little one had anything to do with this, but was ashamed at winning continually. She raised higher and higher sums, but this did not prevent her winning. Her hands perspired very much, just as they did during the production of the phenomena. The connection between mediumship and conjuring is more intimate than is usually believed. Only people are most usually mistaken in regarding mediums as clever conjurers. The connection is just the reverse. Man has so little invention that he cannot even invent a lie of whole cloth. Even in his prejudices, he only goes by things observed, badly observed be it understood. Even in his most fantastic creations, he repeats and imitates something even without suspecting that he does so. The science of mediumistic phenomena is as old as the world, forgotten, profaned, and ridiculed after the decline of the ancient religions. It has given place to a much more popular science, more easy, less fatiguing, that of conjuring. But I have no doubt myself that the majority of conjuring tricks are only a coarse imitation, often ingenious, of true mediumistic phenomena. I think he's still referring to the roulette here, so he's just saying that it can be a trick when it's done by other people, but Mademoiselle Tomchuk has for sure been truthful. Now, if all this sounds very convincing to you, and you start to doubt your beliefs in the supernatural, because clearly such an educated man would be paying close attention to his subject in case it was all cap, because his scientific career was at stake. Now, this feeling of, oh my god, it must have been true then, it quickly fades away when you see... <laughs> photographic proof. I mean, the photos of Miss Tomczyk levitating this stuff, they look perhaps less staged. They are very well made. But there was one instance where apparently little Stasia asked Miss Tomczyk and Julian Horowicz to leave her alone in a room with a camera. She was like, you guys, I'm feeling myself today. Um, let me take a selfie. And when I when I read this, I was like, oh my god, I'm really curious what it turned out like because there was a photograph attached to the article. Uh, the article is in French, so we're not gonna read it. But when I tell you that that photograph looks like a 12 year old cut out a photo of a child and glued it to a black background. Like, you just cannot take it seriously. They did not even follow the shape of the silhouette. It's hilarious. It kind of reminds me of those fairy photos of early 20th century, but even worse, even worse than that. And that's the case with a lot of photographic evidence from that time, because what the scientists at the time called plasma or spirits is so clearly just a bunch of sheets that was either done with double exposure or straight up painted on the negative. It's just very low quality, very bad. And it's just difficult for us to understand why it was such a big deal for them because they're clearly so fake. But also the fact that this photo was taken sort of in the presence of Julian Horowicz. Like it wasn't just Miss Tomczyk going like, oh, I took a photo of little Stasia, have a look. The fact that someone had to develop it, someone had to cut out the negative, someone had to copy and paste an image of a young girl, someone had to drape a fake fabric on her body because she was supposedly naked, but obviously they couldn't find or take a photo of a naked child, so they had to drape some sort of fabric over her. The fact that it was all done and he was involved makes me believe that he was in on everything. Because in what world would that happen? Even if he did believe that this was an actual photograph of the little Stasia phenomenon, how would the photograph even be taken? How would the negative be taken and developed without him being involved in the process, without him noticing that something is off? So my theory, having seen that photo, having read his article about how the photo was made, he was 100% on it. He knew full well that she is a fraud and they were both like, okay, I think we can do something here because I'm a scientist and I think you could be really famous. I think you could earn a lot of money because also the, the roulette facts, like I can't get over the fact that she could make the roulette show any number that she wanted and she didn't feel like making that her career. I find this very unlikely. <laughs> what I also find interesting about the way that he describes the experiments and the way that he describes her is this sort of like mystification of women. It totally makes sense why they believe that 
women were more natural at being mediums because he treats her as a sort of very frail, very mysterious object, like a physical object that biologically you have no idea what's going on with her. And that kind of adds up with the fact that medicine back then was also very much not knowing what was happening to women. And it was only in the early stages of like catching up with female biology. But at the same time, it was still way behind. And I think that kind of shows in his approach to the medium because a lot of the things he's like, she's so mysterious. I have no idea how that's happening. She's fatigued. She's frail. She's sweating. He just treats her as this really alien being. And I feel like that's something that is very characteristic for the era. This is all. Let me know what you think. Was she a fraud? Was she actually a medium? Do we just not understand it nowadays? Maybe it's just the times that have changed. I don't know. Let me know what you think. Anyways, stay spooky. Thank you for listening and until next episode. Bye!